So there's a, a story in our family that I've told in different venues. We couldn't remember if I told it in a sermon uh, illustration, so pardon me if I have, but it relates to when we moved from Chicagoland to Dublin uh, in the fall of 2007. In the fall of 2007, uh, 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 Annika was just about two years old or so. Uh, she's not here in worship this morning, so I can tell this story. Uh, no, she actually knows I'm going to tell it. Uh, she was about two years old. Uh, we were moving. Uh, this was the first move where we were able to use a moving company. And so, you know, we had the guys and the truck, and they're boxing up all of our stuff in our, our little house in Aurora, Illinois. And about midway through the morning, one of the movers comes up to me and he says, sir, you need to control your daughter. And I, I mean, movers are usually not small men, right? And if they are small men, they're small but strong. And so this is a, a you know, big guy comes up and he says, you need to control your daughter. And, and, and Annika is probably what? She's probably like 35 pounds. And um, I, I'm like, well, maybe you could explain to me how she's creating problems for you. And he says, well, she keeps, she keeps following me around. And I'm like, well, you know, two-year-olds do this. She, no, she keeps following me around. And every time I build up a box, she gets in it. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, she, she, she gets in the box. And then I've got to take her out of the box in order to put the stuff in the box. And I'm like, well, okay, I'll, I'll go talk to her. And so I, I went, I talked to her. I'm like, Annika, why are you getting in the boxes. She's like, Dad, I, I don't want to get left behind. I, I want to go on the move. And I said, Annika, good news. <laughs> you, you get to go on the move. You get to ride in the car. <laughs> and that was, you know, it was a great moment. But, you know, no, no kid wants to be left behind. No parent wants to leave a kid behind. Uh, it's actually not uncommon as life goes on that uh, you do leave your kids behind sometimes. Uh, well, maybe you don't, but, you know, they, they make friends. They, you know, you go to a group activity. They're with their friends. Uh, you think that the other parent has coordinated a return trip for them or that they've found a return trip for them. Uh, and, in fact, that's not the case. And you get a frantic phone call later in the day. It's all part of the experience. And we wonder if something like that is happening here in Luke chapter 2, that Jesus has been left by his parents in Jerusalem. And so let me ask you this question. It's our big small group this morning. Uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, of all of the potential stories that could be told about Jesus and his childhood, because this takes place when he's 12 years old, so we know about his birth, we know that when he was about two, his parents took him to Egypt for about a year. And then we know nothing about his childhood up to this moment. And then from this moment onward, we know nothing about Jesus until he pops back on the scene at about age 30. So why this one story about Jesus? Out of everything that... That, that might have been available to Luke, the gospel writer, uh, to talk about Jesus. Why does he focus in on this? Is this a story about Joseph and Mary as parents? Is this a story about Jesus? What is this story about? Well, we know that Joseph and Mary were people of integrity. We know from the birth narrative that they were each people of integrity. We know that Joseph was a man of integrity, that he uh, intended in the, uh, the news from the angel to him about Mary's impending pregnancy, that he intended to treat her well and not shame her. We know that Mary uh, is a young woman of integrity. We know that they are, from this story, uh, concerned parents, that they're committed worshipers. Luke tells us that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, so they would have come up from Nazareth where they were living up to Jerusalem, and this would have required some effort on their part. By the time that they, they come to this moment in time where Jesus is 12, probably uh, Jesus has at least one uh, or several younger brothers and sisters. We know that he had younger brothers and sisters, half-brothers and half-sisters, James, Jude, and his sister at least. And so 
Uh, so there's this family clan coming up from Nazareth, and they did this every year. They're faithful, committed worshipers, and we know that they were invested in Jesus' development. It's interesting. If you do have your Bibles, you can see it uh, in verse 42. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And this word custom is interesting. It might mean they went up as was their custom every year to go up for the Passover. Uh, Phil Riken, uh, the current president of Wheaton College uh, and the past senior pastor at 10th Pres in Philadelphia, in his commentary on Luke, uh, says that the custom that is in view here is not the custom of their annual trip up to Jerusalem for the Passover, but the custom of Jewish parents to introduce 12-year-old boys to rabbis in advance of them turning 13 and coming into what we might call the bar mitzvah. They're being accepted into adulthood into the Jewish community. So that might be the custom uh, that is in view. But no matter which way it's intended, uh, what is on view here is the faithfulness of Joseph and Mary as committed worshipers. And they've taken their family up to Jerusalem and they've lost track of Jesus. What is this story about? Why does Luke want us to know this story about Jesus? Well, I think the story is less about what kind of parents Joseph and Mary were and more about what kind of son Jesus was. And the reason that I think that is because Luke tells us in the beginning of his gospel, the very first verse is why he wrote the gospel. This is what he says to his reader, Theophilus, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So Luke is interested in writing a history. He's interested in talking to eyewitnesses of Jesus's life. And Luke would have had available to him Mary as an eyewitness. And he would have talked to Mary about what kind of child Jesus was. And we might assume that he heard many stories about what kind of child Jesus was, but he includes this story and I think that he includes this story because Mary is an eyewitness to the incarnation. She's an eyewitness to the incarnation, not simply in, in, in the events that we remember, mostly on Christmas Eve, the announcement, the birth, the nativity. Uh, but she's an eyewitness to the incarnation all the way through. She's an eyewitness to the incarnation as the Son of God grows up in her home as the Son of God and as the Son of Man. And I think Luke's interest here is to just give us a snippet of the kind of son that Jesus was in order for us to understand how even as a child, the Son of God, the God-man, God incarnate, uh, lives his life on our behalf, that he is accomplishing gospel realities on our behalf even as a preteen. And that, I think, is why we have the story that Mary is an eyewitness to the life of the incarnate Son. And particularly in this, in this story, in Luke 2, we see that she is an eyewitness to the Son's understanding of His identity, and she is an eyewitness to the Son's obedience. And those are really just the two points and then three applications. And briefly, she's an eyewitness to the son's identity. So uh, they've gone up, they've worshipped, they've kept the Passover, they're traveling with relatives and acquaintances, uh, they're going back to Nazareth, uh, they assume that Jesus is with some other part of the clan, and they miss him. They don't find him, so they return to Jerusalem, and they look for him. They look for him for three days. What do you think about that? That's a long time to be looking for a kid. I mean, they, they must have been panicky. Like, you think they went to bed? 
Do you think they kept looking at nighttime? I mean, that would be super, super stressful. Where's Jesus? I thought you had him. Where's Jesus? Stressful. And they, they find him. And you, you can decide Mary's tone in verse 48. But I don't think it's like, son, why have you treated us so? <laughs> Such a blessing to look for you for three days in this city. Isn't it great? I don't think, I don't think that's her tone. I think it's more like this. Son! <laughs> why have you treated us so? Behold! which is a word that you should often use when you talk to your children. Behold! <laughs> your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. I plan on using this talk later this week. <laughs> it's biblical. Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. Now, there are a couple of lovely truths in there. The, the first lovely truth, which we'll spend less time on, the first lovely truth is that they didn't understand the thing that he was saying to them. I mean, sometimes I think we come to Christmas Eve and we think of Joseph and Mary and they've got the word from the angels and the, the angels show up in the sky and they're singing and the shepherds show up and they think, we think, well, they, they've just got it all nailed. I mean, I mean, they must clearly understand everything about everything that's un, unfolding in their life. But honestly, I mean, this is 12 years later and they're still confused about Jesus. So if you're ever a little confused about Jesus, it's okay. You're in good company. His parents were confused by him. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? The second lovely thing is Jesus' awareness of his heavenly father. Now verse 40, which, uh, which we didn't read Yet the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Jesus grew up like a normal child. Jesus learned things. Jesus experienced things. There was a moment when Jesus was an awkward preteen. There was a moment when Jesus' voice broke. There was a moment when Jesus had to start to shave. He was a regular human kid. And he grew in knowledge. He learned, he acquired. There was time when he didn't understand algebra, and there was time probably when he understood algebra. Some of us never understand algebra. But there was, he grew, he learned. He learned to read. He learned to write. And he learned, he, he learned about his relationship with his heavenly father. There's a lot here that is fun to speculate about that may or not be fruitful to speculate about. Um, the theologians for 2,000 years have contemplated how does this, uh, this God-man with a divine nature and a human nature, how do the two natures relate to each other? Uh, but, uh, and, and we don't have time to think about that at length today, but it seems that his human nature, he's growing in knowledge in his human nature that God is his heavenly father. Now, presumably Joseph and Mary told him the story of his birth. I mean, it is fascinating to speculate what it was like for Jesus to hear stories from the Old Testament and for him to understand that they were about him. Uh, I don't really, I mean, I don't think we can make much of that because it's not in the Bible, but, but it's interesting to think about. A moment where it's like, wow, 
you know, that, that God the Father, the Spirit is revealing to him as he is hearing something read in his synagogue. I say, wow, this Messiah who's supposed to come, that's me. We know that he came into this information by the time that he preaches in the synagogue in Nazareth as a 30-year-old when he reads from Isaiah's scroll and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. We know that he learns and he acquires this information, but here at age 12, he says that he is, he is aware that he has a unique relationship with his heavenly father. And, and Mary in this moment becomes an eyewitness to Jesus' awareness of his unique identity to the fact that he is son of the father in a unique way. And we'll apply that in just a moment. But the second thing that Mary becomes an eyewitness to is she becomes an eyewitness to the son's obedience. Again, verse 50 and 51. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. What do you think he meant? I don't know. What do you think he meant? Well, let's remember what the angel said. That was a long time ago. That was 12 years ago. That was several kids ago. You can remember all that from all that time ago? What do you think he meant? He must be in his father's house. And then Mary becomes an eyewitness to Jesus' unique obedience. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. So Jesus is aware of his divine identity, but also in his humanity, he remains obedient to his human father and his human mother. He keeps the commandment, if you will, thou shalt honor your father and mother. And he keeps the other commandments as well. And this is important when we move to application because his keeping of the commandments his obedience of God's word uh, from uh, just this little snapshot that we get in his pre-adolescence uh, shows us uh, that there wasn't a, a moment kind of in adulthood where divinity was beamed into him like he was this kid in Nazareth and then this teen in Nazareth and then kind of this young adult and then zap! That, that's actually a heresy. That, that, that is not what happened. But a fully God, fully man from birth, growing up, growing in human knowledge, obedient to the word of God, the entire way, obedient to the word of God for his sake, but also obedient to the word of God for our sake, which is relevant for the applications. So first application is that Jesus' sonship re restores our sonship. Jesus' obedient sonship to the Heavenly Father is how our sonship is restored to the Heavenly Father. See, perfect obedience to God the Father was the condition of the original covenant with Adam, right? Keep the law and you will live. Break the law and you will die. Adam and Eve broke the law and death enters the world, but Jesus the Son keeps the law. And His obedience, even in this snippet that we get, His submission to his parents as a preteen shows his obedience and keeping of the covenant. His perfect co covenant keeping qualifies himself to be the perfect substitute for sin, which then is in consequence uh, the grounds of our perfect freedom in Christ as we are justified in Christ. His righteousness for our unrighteousness, his obedience for our disobedience. Uh, and then as we come to faith in him, uh, we are brought into sonship. That when we see Jesus, there's a way, when we see Jesus living as the perfect son, and we even think about our lives, we think, man, he's living perfectly and I goof up all the time. That his living perfectly counts as our living perfectly. His sonship counts for us. Long quote here. I'm just trying to think through what of it would actually be useful. All of it seemed useful when I was working on the message. <laughs> Less of it seems useful now. Um, this is from uh, Thomas Torrance, the Scottish theologian. 
He's found in his father's house about his father's business. And yet son of God, though he was, he remained in subjection as a son to his earthly parents. And through his earthly subjection and earthly obedience to Joseph and Mary, he lived the life of the son of God, become the son of man, taking humanity itself into the house of God the Father. That his sonship is how we come into God's family. That we are adopted into his family. And the second application is that our adoption into God's family gives us great assurance that Jesus' obedient sonship assures believers of the Father's continuing love. This is, this is a point that we talk about pretty frequently at NPC, but just if you're visiting with us this morning, one of, the, one of the errors of thought that I want us to try to improve over time is the thought that Jesus loves me, but I'm not so much sure if God the Father loves me. That I think that, and I just know from talking to Christians for 25 years, that we often have this conception that Jesus is on my side, but I'm not so much sure about the Father. He seems maybe a little bit more distant and aloof and removed, and I'm not sure how he relates to me. I'm not sure how the Father relates to me. Well, uh, the reality of adoption is that it assures us of the Father's love. This is the, uh, the word that we have at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So God has an intent through the Son to adopt believers into his family. And this intent to adopt, this plan to adopt believers into the family extends all the way back in time to before the foundation of the world. That, that, that it is not just that Jesus loves you, but that the Father loves you and, and that the triune God has set his affection on you to bring you into this family relationship with him. Now, you made the effort to come out to church on Sunday morning, so I'll reward your effort with a substantive quote from Jonathan Edwards. There's no better way to say Happy New Year than a long quote from Jonathan Edwards where he really explains two things. First, that, that, that the Father's love for the Son is such that the father will always love the son and not frustrate his son. And that the son's love for the church means that the father will also always likewise love the church. And this is the hope of our assurance. This is, this is how he put it in his sermon. Jesus Christ is God's own son, the same in substance with the father. God necessarily loves him. Tis impossible, but that God should love his son. Tis as impossible as that God should cease to love himself, for he is the same essence within himself. The, the, the father cannot not love himself, and so he has to love the son because they share the same divine essence. Therefore, this may assure the saints that God's love to them will be everlasting, for they may be assured that Christ will forever stand for them because he has died for them. If Christ don't stand for his saints, he will disappoint himself and frustrate his own end in dying. In other words, if, if, if Christ doesn't always stand up for the church, he'll be frustrating himself. He'll be undoing his own work. He's not going to undo his own work. He's going to always do his work. So he's always going to be standing up for and defending and assuring the church of his love. And because he stands for them, secondly, God will never cast them off. Because if he, the father, should do so, he would disappoint his son. So the father is not going to disappoint the son. The son is going to say, keep loving the church. And so the father is going to say, yes, I'm going to keep loving the church. This church that I plan to adopt, that you came into history to save, the birth of which we celebrate on Christmas Eve, the death of which we remember on Good Friday, the resurrection of which we remember on Easter Sunday. You did all these things. You did them because I love you and I gave the church to you and you love the church and you went to save them. And because of all of this love in action, I'm going to always keep loving the church, which is good news for you. And it's good news for me for the moments when we really blow it. For the moments we wonder, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe you don't have moments like that. I sometimes have moments like that. 
I look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm not sure how we're doing. We're not looking good. Not sure how the Father feels about me. When Jesus goes to the temple as a 12-year-old to be in his father's house because he is about his father's business, part of what he's doing in that moment, think about this, in that moment, while Mary is wandering the crooked streets of Jerusalem and she's shouting, Jesus, where are you? Jesus is in the Father's house being about his Father's business because he loves you. What are you doing? Didn't you know I needed to be in my Father's house because I'm going to live and die and rise for Dave who's going to believe in me 2,000 years from now. I love him. I love her. I love you. That's part of what's going on. 12-year-old Jesus loving you. Third, third application. Jesus is modeling a pattern that sonship is the basis of Christian living, not the goal of Christian living. Sonship is the basis of Christian living, not the goal of Christian living. Sometimes Christians think, well, if I, if I do, 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 then maybe I'll be accepted. Do, 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 maybe I'll be accepted. Do, 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 failed, maybe I'm not accepted. Do, 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 more, maybe I'll be accepted. Sonship is the basis and not the goal. Because Jesus did well. Jesus did well, so I'm accepted. Jesus' awareness of God's fatherhood, and then Jesus' consequent obedience creates a pattern for our life. This is what John remarks on in 1 John, his letter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. Sonship, acceptance leads to obedience. That is, as we, even as we go out from here, I don't know if you still do New Year's resolutions or not. I don't know if that's a thing for you. But if you were a New Year's resolutioner and you think, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, you know, 2022 is going to be the year. I'm going to do all the stuff and it's going to be awesome. You can make your resolutions and you can do the stuff and it'll be awesome, but make sure that you do the stuff because you're loved, not in order to get the love. Do it because you're accepted, not in order to get the acceptance. J.I. Packer, I mean, if you want if you want a New Year's resolution, here's one for free. Go back and reread Knowing God by J.I. Packer. You're like, well, I, I've never read it. Well, there you go. Something to do. You can do it today. J. Packer puts it this way. You sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayer and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. The revelation to the believer that God is his father is, in a sense, the climax of the Bible, just as it was the final step in the revelatory process which the Bible records, end quote. Being adopted as a son or as a daughter of the king is the highest privilege that you will ever have. Through all the ups and downs and ins and outs of your life, there will never be a higher privilege than being a son or a daughter of the king, being a co-heir of the kingdom with Christ, having him to be your older brother. That's the climax. That, that's the climax of the New Testament, it's the, which is the climax of the biblical revelation. That's what it's pointing to, that Christ's sonship counts for you. Jesus said to them, why are you looking for me? Do you not know 
that I must be in my father's house. He goes to the father's house because he's the son. He goes to the father's house for you. He goes to the father's house for me. He goes to the father's house so that we have this pattern and that we have the assurance of the father's love. What's going on in Luke 2 in these verses? It's not so much a story about earthly parents losing a kid. It's a story about a heavenly parent sending his son to gather many kids. That's what the story is about. And may you be one of those kids.